Are you envious because I am generous? These words strike to the heart of each one of us today. In the gospel, Jesus tells us this beautiful parable of this generous landowner who hires laborers at various times throughout the day, yet he pays them the same wage. Doesn't that make him fickle? Doesn't that make him unjust? Isn't he unfair? How rude. But this is the old way of thinking. This is what Jesus is trying to scatter. This is what Jesus is trying to correct in the hearts of those who esteem themselves worthy of honor, worthy of praise, worthy of retribution for the hard work that they've done. We all have experienced it in our life. We probably know people, probably from our family or the people that we follow on what used to be Twitter and on YouTube and all the different social media. We see those peoples who continue to seek out God because they deserve it. Because they're working hard. They're bearing the brunt of the day's labor, the bearing of the heat and it's making them angry. It's making them angry because God is generous and God allows the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust. Are you envious because God is generous? The truth is, is that God, in his mysterious divine providence, allows these things to happen. And he chastises us through Isaiah this, mo this morning in our first reading to say, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are so far above your thoughts. But he tells the wicked, forsake your wicked ways. Call on the Lord with mercy. He who is generous in forgiveness. It reminds us of this virtue of humility, acknowledging that our understanding is limited compared to God's divine providence. He sees all these things. He knows what the wicked is doing. He knows what the just is doing. And he loves them. He loves them so that they will convert and he loves them so that they will persevere. But so many of us, so many of us, we see the unfairness of God. And we say, he is unjust. He doesn't know what he's doing. If only he would let that person die, it would free us of this burden. If only that person were out of my life, I would finally be at peace. We're not acknowledging the true God. In God's providence, God has put these people where they are, wherever they are. God's directing us to something more today. And he's saying to each one of us, do not judge yourself by what you think you deserve. Or, more importantly, do not play me. Do not try to be me and tell me what they deserve. What others deserve. Because that's where the grumbling is happening in our Holy Gospel. In this parable of the landowner, they grumble. They grumble those servants who were called early in the day, who have been working in the Lord's vineyard their whole day long. They were promised to be paid a daily wage. And they grumble because they think that everybody else doesn't deserve what they should get. I've borne the heat of the day. I've been in the Lord's vineyard. I've been working for him. I've been staying faithful. I've been living a virtuous life. How come they get God's mercy? How come they get to be paid the same as me? Me, me, my, my, my. We get stuck in that me circle. And we forget that God is one who is selfless. He came to serve, not be served. We 
are made in his image and likeness, and we are called to imitate Christ. We are called to be generous. We are called to give of ourselves. And if you have the security of a job, why are you ticked off that other people get to be hired too at the same company? You should be happy. You've got a guaranteed salary. You're not standing on the corner at five o'clock in the afternoon looking for somebody to actually employ you today. Otherwise, you're going to go hungry. Don't forget that that's what this parable is about. Those uh, hirelings, those who were sitting on the corner, standing there idle all day, if they were not hired, they would have got nothing. They went empty-handed to their children and to their wife, and they would say, I got nothing. But this landowner is so generous that he'll even employ them for one hour and give them a total day's pay because he's that merciful. He's that generous. He loves them that much. But are you envious because I am generous? This message challenges each one of us. Are we quick to judge ourselves? Or most of the time, are we quick to judge others based on the past or the circumstances of their life? Do we harbor envy in our hearts when we perceive someone receiving God's blessings that we think doesn't deserve it? See, envy, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, is a sadness at the good fortune of another. Sadness that this person has good. Why? Because an envious person believes that whatever they just got has robbed me of something good too. No. God's that bountiful, that generous, that loving, that merciful, that it doesn't empty his bank account when he pays them the daily wage. He's giving it to you in fullness. He's not jipping you just because he decided to employ this person at five o'clock in the afternoon. You're getting the fullness. We are getting the fullness. We are not being cheated. Ah, but the envious person believes that he is or she is. And they're mad. And they grow to be 60, 70, 80 years old. Miserable, resentful, angry at the world and angry at life. Because I've been bearing the heat of the day. I've been here all along. I've been living a holy life. And that person has squandered everything. And yet God's going to be merciful to them. God's going to love them too. What a challenge. Because it sounds like, to me, I know it's kind of close to our heart. Sounds like the older brother of the prodigal son. Right? Grumbling. I've been working in your field, Dad. I've been here. You haven't even given me a goat to play around with my friends, to get, hang out and drink and have fun. When we come in from the work, you don't say anything to me. You don't even say thank you. I, I mean, I've been working here for years, and then this son of yours comes back. Give me a break. You're going to kill the fatted calf for him, this loser? The envy. It's like a cockroach. You just want to like smash it. Get rid of it. Get rid of that envy because it will breed resentment and I will turn into an old hag, an old Catholic hag. Ugly, miserable, and angry. Most of all at God because of what he has allowed in this world. What a pathetic life. Pathetic life because it's not filled with joy. It's not filled with love. It's not filled with the peace of Christ. That sadness at the good fortune of another, that's the motivation of the devil. Envy was the motivation. The sin that the devil committed was pride. Absolutely. It's always about pride. He wanted to be like God. But the motivation for his pride, it was envy. It was envy at what you and I 
are privileged to get because of Jesus Christ. He was envious of God's most lovable creature, the one made in God's image and likeness. The fact that God so loved the world, he would send his son to free us. The devil said, non serviam. Uh uh, no way. I am sad that they're going to get your glory and your love and your mercy. Uh uh. And what did he do? He decided to make war on that same creature because he knew he had no chance against God. So he's coming after you and me to be like him and be envious at what God is doing in this world, the blessings that God is doing and giving each and every day. We get so caught up in our lives. We get so caught up in pessimism and cynicism and what everybody else deserves and what I'm not getting. You totally miss the things that you are getting, the things that God is doing in this life, the peace that he wants to give to you. If you would just let go of the past or those circumstances that you have shackled God's power by. Jesus teaches us today that God's love and generosity are not bound by our human calculations of fairness. What's most striking about the landowner parable is the fact that he himself goes out. There's other parables where it says the king sent his servants out to go collect those who were on the highways and byways to come into the banquet. The landowner sent a delegation to go grab people. This parable, the landowner is looking for the servants. He's looking for those who will be hired by himself. He goes out and seeks them out. He is relentless because he himself is going to find laborers for his vineyard. And he's going to call them. Call them in the early hours in the morning all the way to the last hour of the day. He is constantly willing to hire people who are still standing around, doing nothing. He's going to call them to the fullness of life and his desire to pay them a full day's wage. This gives us hope, my brothers and sisters. This parable is what you hope for every time you pray for your kids who have run away from the faith, who have left the one true holy Catholic and apostolic faith. There's still hope. Why? Because he still calls them at the last hour. He still calls them. It doesn't matter if they're 85 and you've been dead for 65 years. He's calling. He's knocking. In Revelation, the last book of the Bible, he promises, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And those who open to me, I will come in and have supper with them. I will come into their house. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So you better start if you haven't started or continue if you've already started to ask, seek, and knock. Persevere. Persevere in hope that the Lord is the one who calls and his call is irrevocable. Non-revoking. It is always happening. This is our beautiful faith that we have because it must be received. God calls us to embrace that wisdom of the gospel we see today, that his mercy and grace are abundant and they are freely given to all who turn to him with their hearts, regardless of when they come. He tells us that his son Jesus, Jesus, is going to take the initiative to seek us out. He's going to choose each of us despite our utter unworthiness. God is going to lavish his self-gift upon us. He is going to love us. And our response is to love the kingdom of heaven and love the landowner and the way that he acts with sinners, with idle people, with laborers. In truth, God is always giving us far more than we deserve and even calling us into the labor of his vineyard. Us priests being the last of all. Like St. Paul, we should say, I was the least. I don't understand why he called me. I don't know why I'm up here. 
having the privilege to stand before you and try and encourage you in living the holy Catholic faith. But I know he's done it. I know that he's asked it of me. And like St. Paul, woe to me if I don't preach it. If we don't preach the truth in love, we are woeful. So the fathers of the church tell us that God gives to each one of us, no matter when we're called, the same gift, the same wage to all. Because the one thing that God gives to us, the one thing he has to give to each one of us is his son. His son, Jesus Christ, single, whole, undivided, all-sufficient. St. Paul tells us in Romans, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Give us everything with Jesus. With Jesus, we have everything. This is the beautiful gospel message, is that you were created out of love. Sin broke that relationship that you had with God, but yet God sent his son, Jesus, to suffer and die for us. We must respond to that. Our response is to say yes to God's love for us and to see See his divine providence. See his divine justice. That's what this parable is all about. God's divine justice that condemns sin, but always tends in the direction of justifying the sinner. Condemns sin, but always is in the direction of justifying the sinner. Bringing him to mercy. Bringing her to God's love and mercy. Raising that person, that person that was made in the image and likeness of God to the fulfillment of their call, to the fullness of life. So the point is precisely that the infinitely boundless mercy of Christ, which is impossible for us to merit, you can't deserve it. For each one of us, that mercy of God puts itself lovingly in the place of me and you before the holiness of God and justifies us. It makes me and you worthy of participating in God's own life. This is the revelation of God's super abundant love for us, that it has no limits, that it's irrevocable. You can't unbaptize yourself. You've heard me say that before. You have been chosen, bought at a price. And what's beautiful is that the Lord gives us himself today at this Holy Mass in the Eucharist, in this three-year Eucharistic revival when we should be praising God, we should be celebrating him. The devil hates the fact that God has selfless love for you and gives us his body, blood, soul, and divinity to nourish you, to keep you persevering, to keep you hoping, to keep you in faith. He hates it. And that's why God keeps doing it. He keeps giving us himself. He keeps calling us to the altar of the Lord. He keeps giving us himself so that we might be full, so that we might have life, so that we might continue to fight the good fight. So our second reading from St. Paul tells us, conduct yourselves in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ. Are you envious because I am generous? No more. No more. Put off the envy. Put off that envious thoughts so that we might take in the generosity of God. Ask for the grace to clothe ourselves with his humility, his humility that allows us to come and receive him under the appearance of bread and wine. His body, blood, soul, and divinity, truly Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is going to come in under our roof, come into us today. Let us not be envious. Let us not be resentful. Let us not be angry anymore. Put on Christ so that we can have that joy, love, mercy, peace to know that he has us in his divine providence and that he is generous for ages to ages.